Leila Abu Leila is a Sudanese writer whose work has received critical recognition and high profile for its depiction of the interior lives of Muslim women and its distinctive exploration of identity, migration, and Islamic spirituality. She is the author of six novels, River Spirit, Bird Summons, Minaret, The Translator, A New York Times 100 Notable Books of the Year, The Kindness of Enemies, and Lyrics Alley, fiction, fiction winner of the Scottish Book Awards. Lela was the first winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, and her latest so story collection, Elsewhere Home, won the Salter Fiction Book of the Year Award. Her work has been translated to 15 languages, and she has been longlisted three times for the Orange Prize, now known as the Women's Prize for Fiction. Lela grew up in Khartoum and moved in her mid-twenties to Aberdeen. Um, so thank you so much, Lela, for being with us today. Um, it's yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. I hope you arrived in Nairobi well and yeah. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first uh, visit to Nairobi or to Kenya, anyway. <laughs> uh, this is my first event in Kenya, so. <laughs> So I'm very happy to, to, to be here. And it's amazing to, uh, Cheche book is something I saw, you know, on Instagram. I did an event online with them once. And, and to be here is, is amazing, you know, to, uh, because it was just a, a distant, it was a distant place. And now to actually be in the place, it's, it's exciting. Yeah, and it, so thank you for having me. We're excited to have you in this space. And of course, thank you to Cheche and the wonder, their wonderful team for hosting this event for us today. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna jump right into it. I'm so fascinated by your work, especially as um, a Sudanese woman myself, and I'm interested in, yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to just <laughs> to keep it um, reasonable so everybody can have an opportunity to ask their questions. Um, so as I mentioned in your introduction, your novels have been praised for um, depicting the lives and identity of Muslim women. Um, and this has, your books have got me thinking a lot about not only how we identify with ourselves, but how the world chooses to identify us and how we're prescribed with specific identities. And this impacts most of us because most of us have multifaceted identities, right? Um, and so something that strikes me about your knowledge is kind of, about your writing is your ability to almost challenge these notions or challenge like Orientalist thought towards Muslim women or um, masculinities. And um, yeah, Minaret, of course, is a great example of this. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, can you discuss how religion and identity inform your writing? And how do you navigate the portrayal of these type of themes in your work? Yeah. So um, if you're coming in as a, as a, um, uh, as a reader of English and you're, you're, you're looking at the, the literature canon, which is European, uh, which is written in, uh, the one that's written in English or other European languages. Of course, we, uh, we notice that, that it's, um, it's centering Europe, it's centering whiteness, and we, we feel you know, that we are not, not like that. But it's also centering uh, Christianity. And so as a, as a Muslim reading, uh, whatever classics, Jane Eyre, Dickens, whatever. I, I am aware then that I am, you know, that I'm outside this 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 Christian world, which is making up these uh, these th this canon. And even after that, the the writers who felt that they had moved away the the, the from from uh, Christianity and that they're secular, they're still very much influenced by Christianity. And even something like Harry Potter, for example, is full of motifs that come out of Christianity. That's it's natural, of course, because it's part of the culture, it's part of the tradition, the science fiction, the, the all these genres, you know, the, you, they carry a lot of, of these. So so for me, I felt that this is something that I wanted to do to add you know, that I had something new that I could add this, uh, um, uh, you know, this the Muslim experience and the, the Muslim uh, tradition. Thank you. Um, I think something else that you've managed to add so skillfully is Sudan um, mm -hmm. in your writing. 
And um, yeah, as, as you know, that Sudan has a rich history and a complex socio-political landscape. Um, and so then I wonder off the back of what you just said, how does your personal connection to the country inform your perspective on the country's past, present, um, and how does that come across in your storytelling? I lived in the same city, I lived in the same house. There wasn't, uh, I was surrounded by the same people, the same community. So it, 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 I didn't have a childhood where I moved around and, and, and all of that. It was very, very stable, very centered around the city of, of, of Khartoum. So I knew it well. I, I, I kind of knew the, the people, I knew the lifestyle. Um, so it was very much part of what, what made me and, and it was who I am. So coming and starting to write about it, it, it felt very natural. And yeah, I think that goes for a lot of people who kind of stayed in a city for a while. You start to realize that you know it like the back of your hand. And mm -hmm. something for me is when I left the different places that I've lived, I only realized that I knew it so well um, when I was somewhere else, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I guess jumping off of that as well, um, questions about diaspora and um, migration and belonging, I think are two themes that also come across quite prominently in your writing. Um, can you expand about how or why you chose to explore those in your stories, questions of migration and belonging, um, especially how it's connected to your Sudanese identity? It was these anxieties. I was very anxious about bringing up my children away from home. I could see that, that you know, that they were growing up uh, without knowing Arabic. And I could see that, you know, that I would have had, I would have to make a huge effort for them to, to speak Arabic. And even if I made this huge effort, they don't know the streets of Khartoum. They don't go to school there. They don't. It just seemed to me uh, at the time, it seemed to me like a huge um, uh, sad tragedy. I was very young. I'm in my 20s. And it seemed to me very sad that my children weren't going to um, have the same, you know, upbringing that I, that I had. Uh, so this, of course, reflected in, in my writing. Of course, now that I'm older, I see that, you know, that, that, that that's part of life and moving is part of life. And, and, uh, and you don't you can't miss what you don't know. And they don't miss it. You know, they are not, um, you know, complaining about it. So it was just me and my my own um, anxieties, I guess. Yeah. I also I lived at a time when when. Um, when I, in the 1990s was the start of this anti-Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric in the media, in the Western media. Mm -hmm. And it built up from the time of the first Gulf War. It built up, it built up, and then it reached, uh, you know, a crescendo at the time of the September 11. So I was living this day-to-day -day life and, 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 and f you know, feeling it uh, around me. And... Um, moving as I did, leaving, you know, remembering my life in Sudan and, and, and the life I was living in the West, it did feel like a come down in the world. You know, it felt like a, um, a, a kind of a loss and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and a struggle to be in a place where, you know, people didn't really want me around. So mm -hmm. that was something that, that also uh, I was dealing with, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to move to talk about your latest novel. Okay. Um, so River Spirit, for those who haven't read it or don't have it, you can purchase it right outside. Um, <laughs> it's right there. Um, <laughs> and so this is, this is your sixth novel. Um, yes. And this is something that I was really excited about as a historian. Mm -hmm. um, so without giving too much away, um, this is a novel set in 1880s Sudan that is told through the voices of seven men and women during a transformative time in Sudanese history. Um, as the self-proclaimed Mahdi, a prophesied redeemer of Islam, rises to power against Ottoman rule, the people of Sudan must pick a side. It's a story of love, freedom, war, safety, as each character adjusts themselves to frequently changing circumstances and finds themselves on different sides of the conflict during this important moment of um, political upheaval um, and yeah this novel is 
I mean, also strikingly, this discussion of conflict is strikingly similar to what's happening um, in Sudan now and people finding themselves on different sides of that, but I'll leave that for another time. Um, <laughs> but this novel, um, specifically something that speaks to me um, also as like an academic is um, the talks of like imperialism, colonialism, politics and religion come oh. up as really strong themes in the book. Um, and this is particularly because in the novel, Sudan is entering a transformative period um, where questions of identity of what is the Sudanese nation are being brought to the forefront. Um, and these are real life questions that some may say continue to impact Sudan until this very day. Um, could you walk us through what it was like writing themes such as imperialism and colonialism? Yeah. So I had grown up with the story, of course, that the, the, the very exciting story of how um, there was an uprising led by this very charismatic figure who uh, people believed was the, you know, the Mahdi who was going to herald the end of time and how there was the British governor general in Khartoum, Charles Gordon, and uh, they managed to put Khartoum under siege and he was holding out and he would stand in the palace and look with his telescope waiting for the British to come and save him. And the palace was, you know, near near where I lived. It was like 20 minutes away or so. And, and um, you know, the, this was, you know, sort of my city. I grew up with this story. We did it in school. We did it in university. And um, it's, it's, it's quite a thrilling story because you're, it's, it's the will they get, will they save him, won't they save him, this, this kind of thing. And um, so I, at first I didn't, it wasn't really something I wanted to write about because I thought it was, you know, war and conflict isn't really my, uh, my territory. Uh, but then I thought, but I wanted to, to, um, to have a link between Scotland where I lived and, and Sudan and, and he was, Gordon happened to be uh, Scottish. So I, I thought that would be good to, to, to write about. And then when I did the, the proper research, I found that, um, that, 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 that there's more to the story than what the, the colonial narrative was, which was very imperialistic and very sort of, um, um, actually it was uh, edited and, and, and geared towards um, uh, encouraging the, the British published public <laughs> to support an invasion of Sudan and bring Sudan uh, to become part of the British Empire in, in order to avenge Gordon. So there was a there was a kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a beating on this theme of we need to avenge Gordon, we need to avenge Gordon. So a lot was published um, on, on that theme. And then the, 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 the version that we studied at school was very Sudanese, very nationalistic. As in, and this is a national movement. This is a movement against the foreign uh, occupier, the foreign enemy, um, and it, it kind of also uh, covered a lot of the faults of the of of, of the, the uprising. You know how brutal it was. How um, it, even though it started maybe with good intentions, it eventually started to be like ISIS or like Boko Haram, and that a lot of the people that they branded as infidels were actually Egyptian Muslims and, and, and all of that. So the, the I tried somehow to get to 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 you know to dishing out more of the of the truth rather than follow these two extreme uh, kind of uh, versions of, of of the history. And yeah, you definitely do that very skillfully through various perspectives throughout the novel. Um, I was wondering if you'd be so kind to read an excerpt for us from, from the okay. book. Okay. Um, and you chose uh, the... Yeah, because... <laughs> 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 uh, Would you like to pick one? No, no, you choose. Okay. You, you've uh, yeah, chosen so I, already. I, I, picked, I picked this one specifically. Um, because A, I was looking for one that didn't ruin the book in case people hadn't read it. Okay. Um, and, and also, um, it's set in Al-Ubayyid, where my grandma's from. So oh, I, okay. And I think it really brings out what you just spoke about really well. So, okay. Um, if you could read that. So as we said, there's, um, there's different... Um, oh, I like this part, and I, I won't say it. <laughs> So it's different characters, and this character is this young man called Musa, who uh, who who follow who becomes a follower of, of of the Mahdi. And this part actually 
um, describes this, this, this procedure. So it's, we are in Al-Ubayyid um, and, and it's 1880, 1880. It started with a new zikr we could hear at night, a different kind of chanting, raw and catchy, prayers wafting in the dusty breeze, sung by nomads and, nomads and traders, sung around campfires and flickering lanterns, chanted near the big creek by men sitting on cool, clean sand in starlight and moon glow, carried through dunes and waterways, the words circulating under trees. And it would continue through the night. There was nothing foreign about the zikr. It was our own language, familiar and fresh like a newborn from amongst us. It spoke to me after midnight. It spoke to us all. It said, wake up, you've been asleep. It said, wake up, you've been exploited. It said, this is but a dream and reality a step away. It started with a new zikr that lasted until dawn, that came with promises, that came with hope and pride. It said, you've been pushed aside, pushed around, squeezed, butted, cowed, held down. You've been robbed in broad daylight, sucked dry. You've been fooled. You've been strangled and the end is there, there across a burning stretch, across spikes rising from the ground, past traps, across pits, over water in which you could drown, but you will not drown. You will fight and win. You will fight and own your enemy's weapon, take his women, ride his horses. You will win because you will not be alone. There will be angels fighting by your sides, jinn on horseback. They wait for you to spring forth and then they will rise. But no, it started well before the zikr. It started with games that we youngsters played. Two banners, two groups of boys fighting under different flags. The banner of the Turks and the banner of the Mahdi. Only the expected one could challenge the beastly Turks. We, children of al ubayyad would make the banners out of branches and old discarded cloth, whatever we could find, and there was no consistency. One time the black banner would represent the Mahdi, one time it would represent the Turks, a red banner, a green banner. The day I took part in the game, it was the green banner, and I was on the side of the Mahdi. We fashioned wooden swords and we beat our opponents, the sons of brigadiers and constables who fought on the side of the Turks, the game t- turned violent. Blood was spilled until a surgeon slave ran to report us to his master. We were winning before the elders came to break up the fight, gave us a telling off too. Then we knew that what we were doing was more subserv- subversive than a children's game. People were always talking about the expected one, the rightly guided Mahdi, wishfully at first, then with urgent need, with anticipation. He was our last resort the sure way of success. Only someone divine could beat the Turks. Only someone backed by angels could face their savage whips and Remington guns. Only someone sent by the Almighty could drive them out of our lands. And so the hope circulated and we bided our time, except, of course, those of us who were in the pockets of the government. And they were many, for a colonial administration needed its workers, from officials to the lowliest water carrier those directly and indirectly employed by the government, and those who supplied it with hay for horses, firewood, and the laden caravans that made their way north to Egypt. Whole tribes who were benefiting from the Turks, the Khatmiya, the Shaygiya, completely loyal. But for the rest of us, there were taxes we couldn't pay, land we farmed only to yield enough to keep us alive, and the rest went to them. Boys stolen to prop up their armies, girls taken for their harems. No, There were no benefits for us. There was the hate stewing in our bodies, waiting to explode. Thank you so much. Um, Wow, yeah. Um, Could you walk us through, and we talked about this a bit outside, um, but could you walk us through what it was like writing a historical fiction? Um, particularly your use of archives, the type of sources you consulted, and any challenges um, you might have faced in doing so. Okay, so um, as kind of this part showed that Sudan was at the time, you know, ruled, was part of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, it was on the edge sort of the, of the Ottoman Empire, and it was ruled uh, through Egypt. And, uh, and so the, this coincided, this uprising, 
in which people were feeling so um, oppressed by these heavy taxes coincided with the with the decline of the Ottoman Empire. It was starting to shrink anyway. Um, and that's why this movement wasn't nipped in the bud. They, they didn't they they could have easily uh, sort of uh, suppressed it, but they, they, they just could, didn't put the effort. They didn't have the sources you know, to put it in effort uh, in, in, in so in this kind of uh, sort of outskirts of, 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 of their their em empire. Um, in terms of, of, of the of the research, uh, I went to Durham University, your university, which holds the Sudan archives. And uh, there I found something very interesting. I found a bill of sale for a, for a, um, a, a slave girl. And it had her name, Zamzam, on it. And it had the amount of money that was uh, exchanged. And um, I knew that slavery existed in, in Sudan in the, in the 19th century. But just to, to, to see this in front of me, written down like that, obviously, it was a kind of, not a shock, but it was like startling, you know. And then, uh, so I began to think about this girl and, you know, what is her life and what happened, you know, how did she become Zamzam? Maybe that wasn't her real name. And, um, and then there was another uh, thing that I found in the archives, which was a, a petition raised by one man against another man, saying that he, he, he had an enslaved girl in his household who, ran, who stole a piece of cloth. Mm. And she ran away and went back to her old master, to the old family she was with. And I, try, I, I was curious, why would somebody do that? Why would she not just escape and go back? you know, uh, to her family? Why would she go back to the old family? And it made me research this whole area of East Coast slavery. Mm. And, it, it's, and I found that this is a very interesting, you know, theme that, that uh, not, not much has been written about. You know, we know so much about the West Coast slavery. We, we've seen the films. We know, we know about the plantation culture and the long passage and the Atlantic crossing. And mm. we have all of this. But we don't really know much about the East Side, um, and 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 there's a difference in in you know in the in the in the in the way it was done. There was a diff there was a difference <clears throat> because these societies weren't so capitalist. Mm. Um, they they were really looking to use the boys in the army, and they were looking at the girls for the domestic you know labor. So that was the, the that was the difference and the driving force behind it, and and so the the assimilation was was much faster than in the West. Uh, so the men could you know rise in the army and and gain their freedom quickly by proving themselves, and the the women uh, were absorbed then in the family, and you know because of the Sharia laws which uh, recognized the children that uh, that were born of these enslaved women as being legitimate and, and having you know inheritance rights completely different than than in in, in the United States so this um, this you know created a, a kind of a quicker uh, assimilation and, and a kind of more of an an, an embedded uh, relationship between between people and really every Sudanese family I know has a descendant from a, you know a, a woman who was uh, enslaved um, it's something that people really don't want to talk about, but it's it's very much there in in the culture. And I don't know what your experience of that is. <laughs> no, it's um it's interesting. I think like as you rightly said, there's little that we know about slavery that occurred in East Africa um, and like Northeast Africa, um, in Sudan as well. Um, and it is a taboo. Um, mm -hmm. People don't talk about it. Um, there's if if people do talk about it it's very derogatory it's very racist um and yeah it's and i think also the way that knowledge is policed has limited our accessibility to um seeing those type of archives as you said mm -hmm. you did find some in durham but those aren't archives that are readily available um you can find different types of archives that have to do with different parts of sudanese history um political developments um there's a lot of British colonial documents, um, but yeah, it's incredible that you found those archives and I will have to go look for them when, when I go back. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.
you all so much for coming. Um, I think Nina's gonna sleep. Yeah, there's food outside, <laughs> Sudanese food, so okay. please try it. Um, I think Leila's gonna stay for a bit as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you. And I really enjoyed speaking to you.